It is my great privilege to introduce um, Joanne De Janeiro, the president of the Center for Excellence in Education. Joanne, or Mrs. D, she founded CEE with the late Admiral H.G. Rickover, and since its founding, the Center for Excellence in Education has aimed to nurture high school students and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math. And they also aim to promote collaboration among the scientific and technological global leaders. And Mrs. D is internationally and nationally recognized as a champion for STEM education. And Joanne, we are so happy that you made time to come speak with our young scholars today. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'm the icing on the cake as far as issues related to your application to colleges and universities of your choice. Much of what I'm going to tell you, you already know, or, and I intend to refresh and emphasize several of these issues. I know that we have four 12th graders, so this isn't as relevant to you unless you have not made your decisions even now uh, where you're going, but I know I have nine 11th graders, and of course I have seven from ninth and 10th grade. So what I'm going to tell you is very real. You know, this is a volatile year, and we're going to discuss some of those issues in this year and some of the issues that will even affect next year. Several of the items I've been working with for 38 years. I know the college admissions issues, and if you want to call it a game you must play, we'll do that. But there have been some, some iffy areas and things that you need to consider more closely. You know <clears throat> the goal of the whole process of preparing yourself is to prepare you, your wishes, not your parents' wishes, and God knows, not your girlfriend or boyfriend's wishes. You follow your dream and not those of others, that you will be a credit to yourself, your community, and certainly that whatever field you enter, you will not live like death of a salesman in the career, but unhappily so. And you know that even while you're in the university studies, you don't have to know exactly what you're going to do and you can switch gears, although you will usually stay in STEM. There are so many opportunities and new things to take care of. In fact, you heard Dr. Jamie Wells talk about a new area that I had never heard of, pediatric engineering. Well, there are many more of those areas, all of them exciting that you need to explore. Now in your college and university planning, <clears throat> I always suggest a rule of gold, silver, and bronze plateaus. You want two schools in your gold category, four in your silver and three in your bronze. Now, you can put a couple more in the silver. Your bronze are your safety schools. Your dream schools, no more than two or three. You know what they are. They're a reach because thousands of students are as qualified as you. At the same time, you are qualified. You've got to go for it. Yet know that life is not fair. Schools tend to make some mistakes. And I always say, if you didn't get into your dream school, although you're qualified, it's their mistake, not yours. Your silver category will have schools that perhaps could have been gold. They are still tier one. But when I say tier one, 
I want you to think carefully. Too many students and parents look at ratings. And of course, you're thinking ratings in your case, because some of the alleged best schools for STEM are what are alleged to be tier one. And just of those students who go to RSI in order, it's Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Caltech, Princeton, Yale. I doubt that it's different for you students. And the bulk of our students go to MIT, Harvard, and Stanford. What was most interesting this year, this past student group from the 2020 RSI, for the very first time, Stanford was number one choice. In fact, by a wide, not a wide margin, but several students um, were looking at um, reasons why, but I'm sure that's one of the schools you're looking at as well. Now remember, tuition is not your first consideration, although your parents may be thinking dollar signs, period. But the package and the financial aid that you get will take down that amount for the Ivies to almost the same as a good land grant school like University of Michigan. Now, in the requirements for admissions, the GPA is the least important because in the cases of our alums in our programs, they all have almost a four point or above. And that's expected of almost all students who are uh, wanting to go to an IV. Your IBs, if you are in an IB school, they do look at the demands of the IB, but they do not allow it to excuse you from your long-term impact project or activities. Activities can be globally looked to. In other words, they don't want all activities to be STEM. They want to see a student who is not unidimensional, but can look at the challenges of our planet. And those challenges are multidimensional and multidisciplinary. In other words, if you do only IT activities and your project is IT and you do nothing else but play piano, cello, or violin, which the majority of STEM students do play one of those instruments, it's not going to cut it. Remember two things. Your application must show uniqueness, and creativity. Those variables have not changed for what they're looking for. Now, the activities, of course, if you've written a symphony, if you have been given awards in music, and of course, medals in competitions. It's no secret that of the Ivies and MIT, MIT is looking for gold medalists. Um, where it's not as prevalent and other things will be as important other schools look at. But don't overlook ethnicity, disability, and legacy. Those do mean something. And in your application, you let them know of this, not in showcasing it, but obliquely. That's important. I will speak a little more about your community project and essays uh, a few minutes later, because that's where you need to put your focus. Now, as far as early admission and early action, there have been some change, a few changes in what some of the Ivies are doing. Um, I always advise very good students to go early, get it out of the way. And you're qualified 
to go early, unless you've had a slippage in your GPA for a demonstrable reason, or you have some really good reason for going regular. The IVs that did early took most of the alumni of our programs early. But Harvard decided this past year that they would take most of their students from the regular action. But still, our students that went early got in. Should you apply early or regular? You're going to apply regular to many of the schools in your lists anyway, because you cannot simultaneously apply to two IVs. Now, test, what is being done with tests? It's a moving issue. Many made tests optional this year, but if it was optional and you could take it, you should. Whether many are going back to tests next year, I always say give the admissions committee as much great information as you can. Take that SAT, that ACT, take those APs, particularly take those APs in the subjects of which you are very strong. All right, it is not uncommon for alumni of ours, we have even had a few take almost 30 APs and get fives on them. I would say four or more APs, but not just one. Um, and of course, you don't report anything but the fives. Now, the criteria for you basing your choice, you need to leave yourself fluid and open. Don't just depend on what you see on the web, but look at the breadth and depth of the institutions and know what it really means when we say a strong liberal arts. I didn't say a strong humanities, but of course you want that as well. But in the traditional, the Renaissance meaning of liberal arts, it means those schools graded excellent with STEM and the humanities, the philosophy, the literature, the poetry, um, those are included in fine liberal arts programs. It's not the largest schools, but you want to look at what kind of curriculum are they offering. Now, when I say look beyond uh, the breadth and depth, how many Nobel laureates, how many Putnam winners are there? Do they have RAs? Do they have the, the people in the departments with whom you can connect to ask questions? Um, this, this is important because you don't want to be a loner and you want to be on top of what the discipline is. How much research money do they have? What kind of projects are going on? Have they gotten some big gifts or are they downsizing their departments? Visit the campus if you can although some of the virtual tours are excellent now. Do not think it's necessary to have a meeting with admissions on the campus. If you visit and you can get the meeting, fine, but it's not going to be held against you. Now, um, another issue is on many campuses, they have offices that help students get summer internships. That's very important because you want to do as many internships with, with research possibilities. And from those research possibilities, opportunities to co-author what you've done in the summer. 
look at the postdocs in the department for information. If you need help with summer internships, of course, CEE also has those DOD phenomenal internships with pay. If you have the wherewithal and your parents can afford it and you can get a great internship, but it doesn't pay, fine. But the name of the game is pay for your work. So you're looking for summer internship with stipends, but what are you getting out of it? We initially years ago placed students for summer internships with the Department of Energy near the Fermi lab. Well, they weren't prepared. They hadn't prepared their mentors and our students were washing Petri dishes, um, doing minuscule work. Before you take an internship, you must evaluate it and know what it entails. Now, with your activities on campus, you need to look at the level of turmoil on the campus. There are some campuses in the UC system, you don't wanna be where they're rioting, they're always in a state of turmoil um, that may be affecting the learning of the students. You want it user-friendly. You want sports, music, hobbies, where you can use your hobby. You want religious and ethnic activities. Maybe you want dorms specifically in a discipline or fraternity or sorority. What is necessary for you is for wherever you go, that it be good for you with a fit and that when you need to clear the cobwebs, because you're going to hit courses, you're going to hit periods in your life where you're a little down, you're a little overwhelmed. You need to step back, get rid of the cobwebs and take advantage of the opportunities for you to unwind with your hobby, with music, with activities they have on campus. You don't want to stay in your room. And we always say what differentiates the creative and unique student from just the plotter. Well, it's the same in test taking. There are some students who are bound and determined they have to get the right answer when they hit a wall. So they spend way too much time on a problem that they could have left and gone over and done well in every other category. You can go against that wall, hit your head several times, but a smart student knows when to back off and go around the issue or back off, unwind and take a break. I've even had some students say, oh, I want a campus that's and in an area location where it's warm, where it's cold. I don't wanna to be too far from home. Um, that shouldn't be the most important criteria at all. Although some say they can't work as well where it's cold and dark most of the time. If you visit the campus with your parents, they're interested in the dorm and the dining hall and the library. Okay, if you're with them, you get them to look at those things while you're going down the halls of the chemistry building, the math building, whatever, and finding out those important things I just talked about. After the USABO, you go full speed in preparation with your literature search. And of course, there are scholarships you should be going after, small and broad. I wrote, co-authored a book in 1985 or seven, I'm not sure, scholarships and fellowships for math 
and science students. It's out of date, of course, but there are other manuals and opportunities to get that information. Take advantage of everything you can and look at the financial aid information on the canvas. Now, I advise you to go to the websites of Mark Kantrowitz, RSI 84, who's known as the, one of this nation's greatest advisors for financial aid. Because you're an alum, a RICOID of the program, you'll be able to email him, speak directly with him about issues, or if your parents have financial aid issues, they can speak with him. Now, the interesting fact, which sometimes surprises me, that many parents don't involve, or many students don't involve their parents in the decision making. That's wrong. Even if your parents did not go to university, they have common sense. They know how to work in communities and their discipline to grow. After all, they've provided a home, food, and opportunities for you to grow. They have common sense. So speak to them because also they're paying for your education to a great extent. All right. Now, you need to think, have you looked at the applications, the common application? What have you done in your summers? Now, it's kind of late if you're going into your senior year, if you did not do research opportunities. It's kind of late to put in new activities and I advise you not to because admissions committees can see the duration of your activities and nothing less than a year counts, period. They want to see continuity and sustainability, something you have been involved with, maybe a couple of things in an activity for several years. If you want STEM, you want medicine, you want research, you better have some things, your activities, summers that you have worked in that area. Now, I tell you when you finish this program, you are thinking of your recommendors. Now, you want to be early in asking your recommendors to write that recommendation. You need to carefully think through usually the two recommendors that are requested in the applications. One, of course, should be in your discipline. If you've done research, well, they will ask for it to be a teacher. It shouldn't be a teacher who teaches chemistry, but you took chemistry a while ago and you've never talked to the chemistry teacher. You need a good recommendation. You need a recommendation that says you are the finest or one of the top finalists or um, fine students that teacher has ever taught. You can, if you have been involved in music or an activity for many years, that second or recommendation may be able to come from them unless they're saying they want both to be from a teacher. I have had students ask for recommendations from teachers they never had for a course. I also unfortunately have been called by universities and said, you know, the recommenders for this student weren't, didn't write very good recommendations. That can hurt you. Ask students from the prior class who are at some of the Ivies or schools you want to go to, who they had write their recommendation. That may be a key because you probably have had some of the same courses if they were a STEM student. 
as well. Also a recommendation, the second one, it's good if it is in poetry, literature, philosophy, logic, because they want to see the multidimensional student. So get your request in early, then maybe a couple of weeks go by and you say, do you need any additional information? You don't bug them, but those that they're writing late, it's like myself. When you're writing so many recommendations, you tend to start saying the same things and you get a little dry. The earlier, the better. Now, also know that the icing on the cake in this case is that the optional recommendation can come from Dr. King or Kathy Frame as directors of the USABO. And this is the gift we give to all students that participate in our programs. We write three recommendations per student. So you select the schools you want the recommendations from us to go. Now the two areas of most import, of course, the recommendations, but there are two others, that personal essay and the impact activity. Those two areas receive the most points. Your essays, of course, the common, the, the listing is online now. Uh, you can opt, I think there are seven or eight options. Be careful to select the option that you best believe you can answer to, we say crudely, sell yourself, okay? Students usually are not braggarts, although you know there are some, but uh, it's hard to brag about yourself. You want to be honest, but they're looking for why you are more qualified or why you should get admissions over the thousands of other qualified students like yourself. They're looking for creativity and they're looking for uniqueness. Your personal essay is not your research. Your personal essay, of course, can be about music, if you've won national competitions, you've written symphonies, whatever. The essay is to show them something different that the application did not cover. So don't repeat what is already given in the application. Of much import, sometimes I think more import than should be, particularly for minority students, is your impact activity. What activity have you been involved in that has impact on a community or a, an area more than your high school itself? Are you involved now? Most students tutor, we all tutor. So that is not something you want to feature unless you've written tutoring manuals, unless your activity has impacted by something you did at a, on a website or a program you've presented a series of webinars, but it is not just to feature the mundane that everybody else is doing. There are so many unusual activities to think about that relate to something you've done for years. Remember, 
The issue is on these applications to work smart, not hard. Your activities, your studies, your goal needs to show a pattern and to fit together. And your impact activity should be started as early as possible, particularly the ninth and 10th graders in USABO should immediately be doing, deciding on an activity and getting with it. 11th graders, it's pretty much done by now, but you have had consistency in some activities, some sports, uh, some philanthropy that can work for an impact activity. Now, as far as the schools go, you want to interview alumni of USABO, alumni of RSI, alumni in your community that have gone to these schools to get their thoughts. Um, what do they like, dislike about the school? Would they go to that school again? Now, remember that many schools have done away with interviews um, with alumni in communities. Um, again, when I say icing on the cake, it really, it, sometimes the chemistry in the interviews is not good and that's okay. Uh, report it to Michelle or Kathy, let them know because we can uh, make sure that your file indicates that, but it's, it's they're speaking to you to see if they think you'll fit. But if you don't get an interview, it's just fine because many schools are not doing them anymore. If you're waitlisted, and unfortunately some of you will be because you're going for the gold and you've got to do that. You don't want to be middle-aged and say could have, would have, should have and kick yourself in the kahuna because you didn't try. If you're waitlisted, you let us know immediately. And for, because <clears throat> um, there are some schools that we have very close relationships with and we can ask for another review of your file. But if you have accolades, awards, and your application went in perhaps for early, you didn't have an opportunity to put those things in. You write a short paragraph cover letter and tell them about these accolades that that can be put into your file for consideration. And remember, when your application goes in, you ask for return receipt requested. That the file is your responsibility. And unfortunately, several times, we've heard from universities because they haven't gotten the recommendations for ex-students. That is sacrilegious, as far as I'm concerned, for recommendors to do that capital sin. But it does happen. You make sure when your application goes in that's where you really hit on your recommender. Did they get their recommendation in for file complete? Okay, so I'm going to open it up for questions if there are any, but I will tell you, uh, which I will tell you on the end when we finish USABO, that the holiday party in my home is particularly scheduled in December, the week usually that the letters go out from universities for acceptance wait list. Now, very, very seldom do we have alumni of our programs rejected. And if they were, they made some big errors in areas I've talked about. Um, I know that you won't do that. I don't expect to see any rejections, but 
when I have the holiday party in my home, we find who is waitlisted, we make those lists, and we do a round with the Ivies and other schools to make sure that your file is reviewed again. That's important. And then students that get in early, um, speak to the students that are waitlisted. Believe when you're going for the gold, you're gonna have some wait lists. Not only that, this is the first hurdle for graduate school, for professional school. Those are even harder hurdles. And some rejections are expected. Um, there are so many CEE and USABO RSI activities for you to participate in over your high school and university careers. Alums help each other with summer jobs. They mentor and staff our programs, as you know. And as a member of the alumni family, throughout your careers, wherever you're located, you have access if you ask, who are the physicians in this area? Who are the specialists in this, this discipline? So many things to be helpful. And of course, alumni write recommendations if they have already been awardees for the Hurt Scholarship, um, the investigatory scholar, Simon's investigatory. Your alums you will see in the news. Your alums of our programs have achieved significant awe-inspiring things, which you also will do. So I'm looking forward, hopefully, to meeting you in my home if we do a person-to-person. -person, and of course, it was Zoom last year. It may be Zoom again this year. But believe me, some of the activities in cities and activities that reunions we have on campus, I would like to meet you and I welcome you up into the upcoming family you will join. So with that, let's have some questions that maybe I can answer or maybe I'll ask Michelle or Kathy to feed in. Any questions? Thank you so much, Joanne. That was so informative. We do have one question from the Q&A. Um, as someone who has never done research before, does that significantly impact my application? It depends on how strong you are in other areas, if you can sell those areas. If you have not had research because you're in a community or in an area where well, they do have some research from community colleges. Um, it can be hurtful if you are from a metropolitan area or a top school where it is assumed you should have had research. If you are from an area, for instance, um, I'm from a very small town in Indiana. No, they would not expect me to have the same opportunities. But as far as for a course, like if you haven't had stat, they expect you to take a stat course online. So um, we'll help you to focus on your strongest points to um, let them know why you're short on any research, okay? You're not gonna be dead in the water because you didn't have research if you can defend it. The next comment is from a freshman. That's Julianne Wu. And she says, thank you for the insightful information. If time resources are limited, do you think it's more important to become a more rounded student or focus on one discipline and do that really well? Do both. Your, your uh, freshman, sophomore year, of course you want to home in on your discipline and show that it's strong. But they want to see that you're not unidimensional, particularly those who are focusing on maybe computational biology. Um, 
they're looking at your activities and certainly your re your impact activity that will show your multidimensional. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So we have one more question is how should we select majors or minors for pre-med? Ah. It's like, you know what I tell when students say, I want to go into business. I want to major in business at Harvard. And I go, fool, it's your responsibility to know Harvard does not have a business major. Now, with majors, mm -hmm. more and more because subjects, uh, disciplines are becoming so, independ so dependent on technology and a multidisciplinary approach. You must be careful on selection. You can say in the beginning or on your application, I have not yet decided on a major, but my interests are STEM related and have been for many years. Remember, you can't be excellent in everything, but maybe your hobby has been writing poetry and it's been published. Certainly then STEM, a STEM subject with philosophy because more and more philosophy students with logic and ability to work those syllogism are getting into medical schools. Just like some of our best students highest performing students in med school or the MD PhD, which indeed you need to look at the HSD program with Harvard and MIT, double E's. Electrical engineering is a very fine major for medical school. And many of our double E's say, if you've gone, if you've done well in double E, medical school is a piece of cake. You do not have to major in biology, chemistry, math for med school, but certainly you need to have a strong base and it doesn't hurt if you major in those. But um, significantly they are looking at some liberal arts, heavy duty majors that make use of higher order critical thinking like philosophy or the language of Latin. Okay, did I answer your question? We have another question from Lin Tao. She says, in terms of research experience, are there different areas of research that are weighted differently? No, um, it is the depth of which you have gone into that area of research. Now, if you're doing research with a professor at who is known himself, um, they they if they know him, they're looking at it favorably. But when um, an esoteric area of research is always interesting, um, I can tell you, um, Kathy and I were looking, and I think Michelle as well. There is, we were looking at Jamie, Dr. Jamie Wells and some of the podcasts she's done. And on a prior podcast, there, wa there was a veterinarian, I don't know what other degrees or if that was the degree, but he's done she has done significant research into behavioral issues of rhinoceros. And it's been published in very fine um, STEM magazines. Something unusual always will touch. Um, it is like, I remember two RSI students, one who did research on koi, goldfish. And somebody said, what is that about? Well, he was an excellent STEM student. It was unusual and they remembered him. Another one had done research on cleaning fish. Um, 
on his experiences um, about fish life, stars, um, the galaxies. You can do research on anything. It's how you dive into it. Nothing is considered lighter weight than any in, in any field. But I would say you just don't ever say, I did research in biology. Uh, that tells them you don't know anything about biology. It's like any subject, physics. What area of physics are you focusing in? What area of biology? Okay, you have to dive in and show, again, your creativity and uniqueness. Um, thank you. So we have another question slash statement. I feel like this idea of uniqueness is mentioned all the time in the context of college applications, but can you talk a bit more about what that means? Each of you is unique. You don't know how to sell your uniqueness. That's the big problem usually, well, with everyone, not just with students. Uniqueness means out of the ordinary. Um, it is like saying, I tutored students in math. That's, that's lovely, but it's not unique. It's not different. Um, they're not looking for difference, just for difference. They're looking at the whole totality of you that is going to offer the university the value plus in their student community. They don't want everyone to look the same, act the same, be the same. And sometimes in technology that happens. With biology, it is so multifaceted that there is no reason you can't make yourself out to be unique in what your interest is or what it isn't in biology. They want to know your soul, okay? You, okay? Um, There's one more, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's one more question, all right? And I think it's important to a lot of the students here. And I'm sure you can give a really good um, viewpoint on it. It says, thank you for your insight and talk. Does participating in sports help someone who is mainly STEM? Of course, of course. You know, the stereotype is that Asian students don't do sports. Well, they really do. But there are so many stereotypes out there right now that are ridiculous. It's not just that you've participated in sports but that you've been captain or a leader. And I remember a student that picked squash. And I said, why did you pick squash? Because she wasn't good at it. She said, oh, because I, I've heard that Harvard was really looking, they like squash players. I said, that is just ridiculous. Um, it can be any sport. It can be an activity that borders on sport as long as it has sustainability. Now you can say, I've played tennis for six years. I love tennis, I'm just not good at it. That's okay. They're showing you have grit, you're showing grit. The best students and those that are most successful are said in much research to show grit that you can take failure, you can take mediocrity, and you can run with it. That you are an elegant winner and an elegant loser. And that's what sports teaches. So of course it can help, but if you don't have sports, I will assume you have some other very strong areas or you're batting zero. Okay. Remember, your job is to sell yourself. And we can assist you with issues in marketing. But it's, it's 
you that have to do those essays and you're going to edit and edit and edit and remember it's hard to do your first essays you're sitting there you can't write it's it's like writing a book i will sit weekends can't even get a chapter halfway done then there are times when you can really zoom through you keep at it and with essays your first essay is going to be horrible you're going to put everything down as you edit you're focusing and it's showing you what you really want that essay to be okay thank you so much joanne inspiring uh Absolutely now, inspiring. I, I said, kids, um, it's a horrible time for you uh, to be going through this process. Your parents are anxious. Um, you're anxious. You see what's going on on campuses. You're worried about the discrimination of Asians, which um, does exist, but not as much with the Ivies as is said. You're going, you've done well. You've done very well. And look where you are with the Olympiad. There is every reason to believe. And the research shows students that are as far along as you are, and you've been excellent in your lifestyle and what you've done in academics. It is a statistical anomaly that you're gonna slip. And I know you won't. Good luck, take care, stay in touch, ask questions. And I am really under the gun with so many things, but you know, I can't forget my first responsibility. And that is to help very fine students like yourself to reach your goals. I'm an email away, joanne at cee.org.